has reconfigured the world in many ways uh, that uh, all of us are still struggling to comprehend. It has changed us politically, it has changed us economically, and it has impacted us in our daily lives. There's a saying that uh, when you have a crisis, you must use it uh, as much as you can. In Africa, we're asking the question today, have we been able to use this crisis to the best of our ability? To help me to answer that question, let me introduce uh, Dr. Mo Ibrahim, founder and chair of uh, the Mo Ibrahim Foundation. Mo, thanks very much indeed for coming through today. After 2008, many people said Africa had a chance uh, to reconfigure itself. And I think we are more than a decade now away from there. And the question uh, people ask is, did we do right? I suggest we didn't. I want to know your thoughts. But secondly, I also want to know ways in which you think we can use this crisis to remake the Africa we want. Well, thank you very much, uh, Godfrey. And it's, it's nice to talk to you. Uh, yes, that's an important question. Uh, I think, in, in general, uh, the, the, I think the African leaders uh, did perform really quite well during the first wave and uh, the, generally the second wave, most of them. Uh, the, 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 we heard really a coherent collective African voice during this crisis, which was interesting. Um, people dealt with the pandemic seriously. And uh, maybe because we had experiences before with pandemics, uh, leaders were quite careful and really took measures uh, 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 very soon, actually. Actual times faster than some leaders in, in the West did, actually. Mm. Uh, so, of course, there was an exception. I mean, two or three leaders were in denial, and, and actually, some of them actually paid a high price in their own life because of uh, their denial of, 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 of what's going on in their countries. But that was a very, very small uh, number of leaders. Most of our leaders acted well. So, in that account, I think, yes, uh, Africa did reasonably well. Although, the pandemic exposed uh, some weaknesses in Africa. The, 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 our health service uh, is really uh, uh, not up to scratch. We have not invested enough in our health services. And uh, then, of course, we have the problem with vaccines and the lack of manufacturing of Africa. We export 98% of our vaccines and medicine, yeah. which is not acceptable. Mm. Because in time of crisis, then people hoard the vaccine. I mean, the, the Niger reaction, uh, the old rich countries is, uh, my people come first. Yeah. Uh, then we are in trouble. Uh, so it exposed uh, some problems. Uh, exposed also some economic weaknesses, uh, especially in countries which rely mainly on, 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 uh, demand from some unprocessed roller, you know, uh, 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 minerals or, or raw materials. Yeah. And uh, when the music stops, then it is a problem. And it should we have to build a, definitely a more diversified economy and we must also trade with each other uh, and instead of relying on very long uh, uh, trade routes, which can can become insecure in yeah. times like this. Yeah. So that is uh, uh, what we take uh, uh, in terms of our performance uh, during the pandemic. Yeah. One of the surprises for me has been uh, the coordination that I have seen coming out of the African Union. I don't know if it is something that you have noticed as well. I wanted your quick thoughts on the role that we have seen the AU play in terms of uh, coordinating Africa's response to just trying to prevent further infections and then also the effort around the vaccine rollout? I think it was really wonderful. And uh, I, I, I'm, I'm a great supporter of the African Union while I'm also critical of our lack of support as countries to the African Union where we still refuse to concede enough authority, enough sovereignty 
uh, to the African Union. But the African Union showed its importance in times like this, uh, when it can really galvanize our position. And I really wish to mention also, our, you know, my appreciation of the role played by Cyril uh, Ramaphosa there. Uh, he, he really stepped up a statement and, and corralled a number of African leaders. And we had these numerous calls for actions, joint yeah. European leaders, etc. That that was really a statement shape. We need to see more of that. Yeah. Uh, then people also in Africa try to share whatever resources they have and uh, vaccines which could not be used in South Africa then was given to uh, you know the brothers elsewhere. I mean that's that that's really wonderful. Mm. So the, 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 I'm really proud of of what our guys did during this uh, uh, tough times. And uh, that's why I always call for really a more closer union. We need to put a you know, union in the world, African Union, yeah. you know. And uh, we need to have this common market. We need to work together. Then, then we can have an effect and we can get things done. Yeah, I'm going to ask you your thoughts about uh, that uh, uh, union at the trade level through the African continental free trade area. But before we go there, I wanted to refer to one of the points that you made earlier where you spoke uh, about uh, the weaknesses. And one of the weaknesses, is, of course, is that uh, we have been unable uh, to come up with any vaccines of our own. We are making noises about other people's vaccines. And therefore, the question then becomes, so how do we ensure that in future, if indeed there's going to be another crisis, we are better prepared as a continent. And I speak in particular about the need for a stronger economic uh, foundation on the African continent. Some people are suggesting that what we require is a rethinking of uh, the economic model, especially as it relates to the African continent. I wonder if you've got some yeah. thoughts around that. I, I fully, fully agree with you, Godfrey, because it's just not an accept. It is not acceptable that a continent of 1.2 billion dollars is unable to produce enough medicine or enough vaccines to look after their own people. Mm. We need we, we need the focus and political will, because I think for us to have a, a successful pharmaceutical pharmaceutical industry in Africa, there are also some conditions we need we need to pay attention to. Yeah. Uh, number one, I think we need. A, just one ban African regulatory authority uh, for medicines. And we can, we have uh, sort of nucleus for that, but we need to accept that because we cannot go, if I go and build a factory in South Africa or in Senegal, or, you know, these are possible locations also for successful pharmaceutical industries. Uh, but then I cannot, I need to wait for 54 approvals from 54 regulatories, sure. and then I don't, cannot take my medicine across the border, then it's not an attractive investment. Yeah. Because, you know, the market is so important, and we need to create that African market. Because we talk about African market, but there's no African market if you have borders. You cannot move goods or services across borders. So we need to strengthen our... Uh, 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 continental free trade agreement. We need to really enhance it towards a common market. That is urgent for us to do. And we need really to strengthen our ban African institutions like the regulatories, etc. CDC, look, the African CDC played a very important role. Yeah. When we come together and act as Africa, we do well. This a team we have, it, you know, it's just like football. You can have gifted single players, but if the team is not working together as one team, mm. then you don't win. And uh, I hope uh, the lessons uh, from here do sink and our leader should really go ahead and we don't next year, the following year, we just forget about it and, and go back to business as usual. Yeah. There is an important role for civil society here. People like yourself, people like myself, young people, to hold our political leaders accountable. Absolutely. To say, that's what we need. Show me what you're doing this year, what you're doing next year. How are we progressing towards these goals? 
That is really important. 100%, and I agree with you. I wanted to know then what you think of the Africa continental free trade area. Do you think that could be the answer to the creation of the market that you use in your initial example? Absolutely, absolutely. It is a first step. It needs to move forward. We need more ratification, and it is it's a good beginning, but it is the beginning. And we need really to keep pushing there. And uh, I also salute uh, some presidents who played an important role in pushing this across the line. Uh, you know, people like uh, uh, Paul Kagame and uh, uh, President Ushuku uh, of Niger and Macky Sall. We need this kind of leadership mm -hmm. and we need them to keep pushing forward. Uh, you know, the Egyptians are also keen about this. And so we need that to, to generate this political will and dynamism in our work to move forward. Yeah. That's yeah. important. Yeah. We, we, we're talking, of course, uh, at uh, the UK uh, Africa Forum, uh, where we are looking at uh, trade issues, policy issues, and we're also talking, of course, uh, about the need for reform as we get into this uh, new reshaped world. So I wondered your thoughts in terms of uh, what you think are key things that ought to be looked at as we try to reframe that relationship between the United Kingdom and uh, Africa, in particular, given the fact that we are coalescing together through the AFCFTA while the UK wow. is stepping back a little bit uh, from the uh, European Union. Uh, yes, I, I, there's a lot of ambiguity here mm. because I hear British rhetoric about global Britain and, and you know, the new uh, Britain which is striking out in the world. But I see actually retreat and uh, I'm unable to reconcile the two positions. Uh, Africa, I mean, Britain used to be a great partner for Africa many years ago. Its trade with, 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 with Africa now stands at 2.4%, which half of what it was some five, six years ago. Uh, so there's less trade actually between mm -hmm. Britain and, and Africa. And then most of this trade actually is with, with two or three countries, South Africa, Nigeria, followed by Kenya. That is even that little trade is focused on this Rica. What about the 54 countries? For sure. Uh, so there is not much there. Uh, France has more trade with Africa than UK. I'm not talking about the European Union, yeah. but it's France okay. yeah, uh, has more uh, 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 trade with, 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 uh, 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 with, with Africa. Uh, then there was this devastating news uh, a few months ago uh, when suddenly in the middle of pandemic and terrible economic hardship in Africa, uh, Britain decided to slash its aid budget from 0.7 to 0.5. Uh, as a result, the aid to Africa has been cut from 2.2 billion to 760 million. Yeah. That, that is a severe and heartless uh, cut in the, in the middle of a tough time which Africa is going through. Yeah. And this is not global leadership. This is not the soft power Britain said it's going to play now. Uh, so I really don't know where the British are going. And is global Britain means now just sending uh, 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 an aircraft yeah. carrier to South China Sea, uh, that makes Britain great, or uh, make it global, yeah. or is it building a new relationship yeah. with, 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 with Africa, showing global leadership, uh, using soft power, about democracy, rule of law, yeah. Uh, uh, you know, these are the things we love in Britain. And unfortunately, I don't see it up to now living up to it. Yeah. I, I'm being frank because yeah. there's, there's no point yeah. thinking about it. Let's talk frankly. So, 
without yeah, doubt. I'm, Let's I'm, I'm, I'm really, I'm really disappointed. Yeah. Uh, uh, look, three weeks ago I was in Paris. President Macron uh, had this big meeting. He got 30 leaders from Africa and from Europe to talk about how to uh, really support African economies during yeah. this pandemic. This is leadership. Yeah. Somebody need to tell Prime Minister Johnson, just look at what what President Macron is doing. This yeah. is leadership. Where are you? Yeah, you go, and, uh, you, you, you're going to my next question. And my next question was going to be, so, I mean, the British would look at this and say, we are, of course, going after what is in their interest. In your view, what is the case for the UK to rebuild its relationship to Africa? That's number one. The second part to that question is, what structures do we need to put in place? You speak of uh, Brigitte Macron and what she is doing. In the case of the British and, and Africa, given the long-standing relationship, what structures do we put in place? I, I, really, I, need, I, need, we, I think we need to reconfigure re, re, re and rethink what we're doing. Hmm. And, uh, because I'm also a British citizen. I'm, I'm an African at the same time, a British citizen. So, Really, I, I'm very interested in, in, in bringing uh, these two together. Uh, and, uh, but it's a question how, how, I mean, I looked at the strategic review and there's nothing there about Africa. Uh, Africa is 1.2 billion people. It is a growing economy, it's a huge market, it's very close to Britain. And we forget about that, and we're talking about a pivot to to Asia or somewhere. And yeah, and excuse me, I mean, you want to go and play in China backyard? I mean, you know, let us be realistic yeah. and understand what is what is this global Britain? What does it mean? Yeah. But what could we offer the UK is in it, return is it, as is Africans it, in terms of rebuilding that relationship more? Why should yes, they be looking it at is, us? Yes, it is, it is a huge market for British pro products. And Britain now is looking for new markets. Europe used to be like 45% of the trade, you know, the market for UK. And that is has been affected now. And Britain is now looking for trading partners. Mm. And what better than Africa, which is so close, so used to British products and, and British history for so many reasons. And those 1.2 billion actually need so much everything because we don't make things in Africa. Hmm. What better market you have? Uh, you know, that, that is a soft, uh, soft belly. You know, you need, uh, that's an easy low hanging fruit hmm. for, uh, 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 for Britain. Uh, you cannot ignore Africa and pretend that you are a global, uh, global country. You are not global. I'm sorry. And uh, you quit Europe. Now you're quitting Africa. So what is it? I mean, you're going to go to the Pacific Treaty and pretend you are an Asian country. There is facts of geography. And this island is anchored here. And this is our neighborhood. We need to find a way to work with our neighbors yeah. because these are our natural trading partners. Yeah. I, I don't need to say that to, to, to the, the British government. I think they should, they know that already. I, th I thought so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think, uh, you know, I remember in 2019 when we were preparing for coverage of uh, 2020, one of the things I remember <laughs> some analysts writing about was that uh, African countries were going to hold more elections than they never had in the history of the continent. I think it was in 2019, if I am correct. So you could use that as a way of also demonstrating to the British uh, that uh, democracy was uh, flourishing uh, on the African continent uh, pre-COVID at levels not seen before. Uh, yes, although that is, 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 is also a little bit checkered, to be honest, because in our criticism of, of, of a British position, we need also to be critical of things happening in Africa because we need to improve it. Mm. And actually elections last year was not a great year for elections, yeah. a great year for democracy, because we have seen a lot of people uh, 
Well, because change, of COVID. Yes, and the more you know, I do see suppression of civil liberties. We, uh, so it was not a great year for democracy, and many leaders took cover of the COVID restrictions to as restriction of your political opponents, mm. not not yourself, and uh, that was not helpful. Uh, I will always will always be honest to look ourselves critically because yes. we need to, to, you know, to start with ourselves, to improve ourselves before we seek improvement in others' behavior. Uh, because this is consistency and we need to be consistent. Uh, so we have a big struggle for democracy. But talk about democracy. Mm. Take a country like Sudan, which is my home country. Yeah. After 30 years of repression and Islamist dictatorship and a regime which divided the country, massacred people in Darfur, in the south, in the east, everywhere, and totally corrupt regime, ended up with a revolution and a democratic transition. Mm. UK, yes, expressed support for that and did few things, but it still is not taking leadership in what used to be a an almost British colony before. Uh, and most of the Sudanese who studied abroad, they studied in Britain. Mm. You know, and, but it is again President Macron who hold an international conference to support Sudan mm. last, last March. And uh, it is Germany who is really pulling all the stops to support, to support this uh, new democratic transition. Britain is doing something, uh, but it's is not taking the lead. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, uh, it's very strange for France, which historically uh, was focused on Francophone countries, to become a great supporter of the economic transition in East Africa, uh, when Britain is just really lagging behind. Yeah. We need leadership from UK. Please show us leadership. Yeah, there's a void definitely that other countries are stepping in and filling in, as you are noting. I wanted to ask you about Africa's stance as far as trying to also to be a contributor to strengthening that relationship between the UK and uh, the continent. How do we do this? Do we do this through the African Union, i.e. trying to speak with one voice, or do we do that through bilateral relationships? Uh, South Africa going and talking to the UK about trade while leaving out Zimbabwe and Zambia and Lesotho and Malawi. This, this, frankly, Godfrey is a problem. And uh, we both share the blames because uh, we Africans are unable to negotiate trade agreements, really uh, comprehensive trade agreements through the African Union because we have not delegated this sovereignty and essential uh, 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 transfer of power to the African Union to negotiate on our behalf. Should we do that? I think we should. We should really be, be, but in order to do that, again, we need to have the basis for doing that, which is something close to a common market. You can have one market with one rule. So we have a single authority which can cut deals in behalf of all African countries. That's one possibility. Another possibility, we have the RECs, the, the regional economic communities, and where people are trying to build uh, this kind of common markets in six or seven regions in Africa. Mm. Uh, that maybe will be another venue for, uh, for, for our trading partners to try to work with those people. Yeah. What is very harmful is to try and cut deals with countries individually, which undermines the fragile uh, 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 regional uh, uh, economic communities yeah. because uh, we, are, we are fracturing them. So we are hobbling the development of these common markets in Africa. I hope we are able to have uh, 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 more agreements with, with either the uh, economic communities or with Africa as a whole, but also Africa need to make that possible yeah. for our partners. Interesting. Uh, Interesting. So, far what, yeah, so far what we see is some individual deals. Uh, uh, I think Britain signed some 16 African uh, deals with some 16 African countries, yeah. which is actually what they call ro rollover agreements. It's agreements they had under the EU before, yeah. and they just roll it now as they came out. 
So there's nothing changed really. Yeah, yeah. Actually, I remember that because I remember seeing Kenya yeah. signing a separate agreement with the UK, and then there were some conversations now flowing out of that, th asking the question: What about the East African community? What about uh, the integration of the East African community that we were championing and also pointing as an example of how the continent could integrate faster? But we're running out of time. I need to get your thoughts on uh, China. China, which is redefining its role in the world. China, which has also strengthened its hand on the African continent. And I want to try to bring into the mix again that British voice while China is trying to, uh, well, some would say, be a better friend uh, to Africa. I wonder what you think about that. I think Africa needs to be friends with everybody. We have no stake at fighting against China or fighting against the West or anybody. We need to be open to trade with everybody. Don't forget that the greatest trade flow is between China and US actually. It was supposed to be the two uh, sparring uh, powers. Yeah, they have, they have the largest uh, amount of trade between themselves. So there's nothing wrong with us trading with China with everybody. Uh, but what is happening now also is that uh, China also needs to take its responsibility as a superpower now more seriously. And uh, we need more clarity, more transparency about the kind of trade deals and kind of deals are, uh, you know, are done with the African countries because some of the deals are rather opaque and some issues there. So there is some question marks China need to deal with. Uh, I'm not also overjoyed by China position on the question of the uh, deferment of the interest mm. payment by African on the sovereign debt, mm. because large amount of this debt actually is owed to Chinese state-owned yeah. banks. Yeah. And China now claims that these state-owned banks are really private sector, so are not covered by the, the, the uh, forgiveness or the deferment uh, of the sovereign loans. Uh, I don't think that's is that's not really kosher. It's not right. Absolutely. Uh, uh, so we we haven't seen China uh, doing much really, other than sending some symbolic uh, uh, shipments of vaccine here and there, uh, but. On the great issue of debt forgiveness, yeah. uh, financial aid for Africa, I said we have not seen much really there. And China now re really need to show its hand. And once you become a big boy, once you become a silver power, you, you come under scrutiny sure. and you really make sure uh, your behavior is really uh, 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 that good and stand up uh, to who you are. Absolutely. Dr. Mo Ibrahim, founder and chair of the uh, Mo Ibrahim Foundation. Thank you, sir, for joining us. Uh, and thank you for sharing your thoughts uh, on Africa, the UK, and uh, the wider world.